I'm glad you're all here because actually you're going to hear the poets of San Francisco. That is what this, this Poets 11 is about. This is the, from all the districts of the uh, city, you're going to hear the poetry of this town with all its variations from the political to the love dimensions and, and other aspects of social life. So I'm really pleased that you found your way here today. Uh, I'm going to call up the names of the district. We'll go by districts. I'll call up the three names. And Byron has provided yes. Uh, the first poets are going to be called up will be from district one. Each poet will read one of the three poems that they submitted. The three poems are, of course, published in the anthology. Before that, I'd just like to mention to give great thanks to Byron Spooner, Judy Bernhardt, Sarah Rosedale, Julianne Nguyen, and uh, Wayne Schellebarger, who did that crazy uh, illustration. These are the, the anthology. Okay, so let's begin. I'll call the names of the three poets from District 1. They are Romeo Alcala Cruz, Kathleen McClung, and Susan Terrence. And also because he's got another engagement earlier from another district, D. Allen will read also with after the first three read in the first uh, section. So would you come up, please? Congratulations. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. And D. Whoopa. D is not here? D. Okay, we'll we'll begin with the uh, Romeo Alcala Cruz. Diary of Ferguson, September 10, 2014. In response to the police with their tear gas, yes, yes, no, no, no. Only I was just trying to sate the anger of summer with rain. In response to the question, did Brown really start the whole commotion? Basically, I stayed home all night without work. Who else is working nowadays after they shut down the factories at this Midwest town? Still waiting for the turnaround for the recession. Jobs are coming, they say. Jobs are wilting like grass. I waited and waited, armed with prayers. At least I will get a runaway bullet from the panicky police who are blessed with new work and salaries to keep this town from blacks and more impatient protesters. I've been watching television all day long and forced to spend the last remaining months after they, after they laid me off in this broken annex with my cousins, father, mother, sisters, and another, another couple, their son and their dogs. Nobody cares. After all the smoke and commotion and shooting, my, cop, my wife keeps a video diary to chronicle, to chronicle our hopes and dreams and post them on YouTube, hoping for some people at least to know we are still barely surviving, but we cannot breathe barely. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Jack. Thanks to tenant activists and uh, rent control laws, I've had the pleasure of living in the same San Francisco apartment for over 20 years. And for most of those years, I've had the same mailman. My poem is titled Anticipators, and it's dedicated to Edsel. Next spring or sooner, Saturday delivery will end. Reduce to five, our days to speak in passing, you and I, of how our years speed by, and how your shoulder bag grows thin, hangs lighter now, how you anticipate new luxuries ahead, pleasure reading at last, Cervantes, Melville, Proust, no more reading zip codes through window envelopes, deliveries of birthday dollars, get well cards, unpaid gas bills, taxes. In July fog, we speak with awe of gulls, enormous crows on thin black wires above the blocks you've walked for years. And we agree, these flocks in recent years have multiplied have honed their skills in reading us and all we carry, all we drop. Thin stuff, transfers, toothpicks, gum. Deliveries from mouths or pockets straight to gutters, beaks. No wonder white and black they lurk, anticipate our moves, our scattered crumbs, anticipate jackpots from Tinkerbell backpacks six-year-old girls adore. Dear courier, you speak of daughters, grown in cubicles, reading sleek screens, phoning across time zones, delivering their news, quick bursts of syllables, adieus, and then silence for weeks sometimes, perhaps a thin dribble of lines emailed, attention paid elsewhere. We nod. We know deliveries wane, cease as seasons alternate, and years like crows fly past. We carry on reading. You bring the bundles to my door and speak of days to come, days full of books that speak a language almost lost, deep stillness, then deep clarity, a trance only reading calm hours will weave. We each anticipate a lightening of load, unhurrying of years, Time ripe for reverence, deliveries within, unpackaged, vast, special deliveries, so to speak, birthed by doorstep years, reading and sorting the quotidian, signed, sealed. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you here. Thanks, Jack. This poem is about a fellow performer, a, a puppeteer who is from El Salvador. It's called El Quinto de Comandante Tomate, the story of Comandante Tomate. So I wrote it in his words. I rode the bus or train all by myself, six years old. It's why I can never sit still. I'd been everywhere by the time I was six. Only one of my family to boys school. It's why I'm still shy with girls. Always in the company of older boys. Prickly cacti I had to scale. My mother always said, you must play with younger boys. You are growing up too quickly. Older boys are just poison to you. At eight, they lured me to the house of ill repute. I told them I'd already been. Hope that would get me off the hook. <laughs> but they were 14, eager to reinitiate an eight-year-old. They stuck two colones in my hand. It became a black snake. 
coffee candy. I thought of how two colones would be fun for an entire week. Plastic cars, mumbo gum, rides to the city and new books. A bony finger pulled me into a room. I saw rivulets, oceans. The woman began to undress. I shook volcanically in tears. The woman grabbed money from my hand. Now get out of here, you big baby. I stepped out the door, dried my tears, waited in the hallway for the other voice. How was it, they asked. Good, good, I said. And you? I wanted to be outside in the air, a payaso, a clown, an astronaut. I read everything. I read flyers on the street. I read billboards. I read labels on foods. No words escaped me. I learned English at seven in school, the colors, the numbers. My father bought me a book of colors. I learned it. I memorized it. In three days, I lost it. I was overcome with sadness. My father beat me. Twelve colones, a five-dollar book, a day's work, and I had not finished coloring the colors yet. The science of military fascinated me. My teachers thought I was crazy. I idolized General Douglas MacArthur and Gregory Peck, who played him. <laughs> At 15, I joined the militia. We were young. Nopales poked behind the ears, but we tried so hard to use a gun. My Gregory Peck fascination subsided. The pistol pulsed on its own, had its own ambulances and mourners. It was dark and had teeth. A relative of the ghost of Justicia judgment, who would pass by you in the city, growing to seven feet tall in front of you, and just walk past, walk into water and never drown, even in the middle of the ocean. Or it was the headless priest, or it was, I was afraid to use a gun. What new spirits would shoot out? I shot at my feet. I did puppetry in the city for children. It was the man who stole a sausage from the butcher, but blamed it on a dog because everyone knows dogs love sausage. So the dog went to prison, La Carcel, but the kids knew really who stole the sausage and begged us to flee, free El Perito, the little dog. They wanted to tear down the paper jail until the real culprit, a thin man with big mustache appeared, admitting he stole the sausage because he was hungry and had no colones in his pocket. <clears throat> Nobody invited us to the factories, but we went. The National Guard marching outside with long rifles. There was not enough fabric for many characters. The bird, La Pajarita, with the prettiest voice in the countryside, sang to the other seamstresses about not having enough colones for Tortillas, sal, sal, frijoles, and pan, bread. The phantom, a white glove figure with black eyes, took the pájaro, the little bird from her factory for organizing a strike of seamstresses, and broke her neck with his white hands. Scars became the other birds in the factory and flew at the throats of the guardia. Sometimes I'd lose my voice. I never had any training. One year at the university till it closed, militarized, guardia phantoms, students in hiding. All blood leaves your face and your veins. When you carry off someone shot in the street, or when you find someone buried or thrown sop sloppily in the dirt, a finger missing, tongue absent, private parts gone, it is that introduction to death, which is the true induction. Everything once in you washed out. Any blood in the veins dried. And you have to reinvent your whole circulatory system. How the blood moving makes your fingers move. How your heart feels the rivers. Fear is the antidote. Fear is the medicine that makes you lean. 
that makes you listen better than to any lesson in high school, to a bullet cutting the air cleanly, to someone walking behind you, to your own breath afraid to come out. With this introduction, it's easier to measure the speed of a new bullet, how fast the belly can flop to the earth. And the two dogs, if the dark one crossed your path, bad luck. We all had it, everyone I knew, even if we walked in the other direction. I had to leave my boyhood friends now in the mountains or in prison. Everyone off the streets by dusk. I left my family, my partner, the fur animal puppets, y la pajarita. Two weeks ago, my partner was captured. I imagine the guardia threw the puppets away or shot them. I am a printer now, have two boys, six and two. They play with their plastic cars, toy men. No one is hurrying them to grow up, but they see different spirits than the ones I bring them. And the elder one wants to read everything and believes nothing. I'm D. Allen from District 9 for at least one more day. I'm going to be moving from San Francisco for good tomorrow. I've been in this city for 12 years, and it's been very good to me. But all that comes to an end when I put everything that I own, including the books, including books that my work has appeared in, into totes and boxes onto a moving van. And all that is because District 9 is undergoing further, and I do mean further, redevelopment. And every single week I see like a, like two or three U-Haul vans per week in my neighborhood alone of just somebody just packing up their personal possessions and leaving the city because the real estate, the regular rents have gone through the roof around here. No thanks to entry of the information technology industry that Mayor Ed Lee has invited into this town. And I'm one of the casualties. I have three poems published in this book. I'm gonna read you one of them. On page 136 of Poets 11, 2015. This is an elegy to a poet who inspired me to pick up the pen and write my own work. This is for a Mary Baraka. This is called Shining Star. I don't have too much time to just sitting around counting stars. I have to be in another part of town to accomplish that. Alone, hiking around a dark Bernal Hill with a flashlight. I could see the stars above much better than I could in the mission's drastic urban change below. One shining star is missing from the ebony sky. The hole it left is untraceable. I followed that star's brilliant shine for over 20 years, caught by its halogen luminance. That star inspired me to craft poems that kill wrestle cops in alleys, make me feel and be me, shake off to the best of my ability madness and dead skull songs, transform my homespun writing into implements that splinter fire, encourage me to keep, keep throwing hard, keep on punching and never let mine enemies dodge once. Use my scrawl verses in a daily struggle that transcends class as my beautiful people with African eyes nose and arms, half a centuries wanting sun aplenty in a vast land where heathens think fascism is civilization and luxury is an everyday comfortable ignorance. In the slums, 
projects and blue collar suburbs. There's always a railroad made of hella human bones. Black ivory, black ivory, black ivory. When the situation worsens, lovers and warriors and their sons should unite and come out fighting its conditions. Even when the devil with the blue uniform and badge shows up in a hot Harlem minute, it's nation time, it's nation time, it's nation time. One shining star is missing from the ebony sky. The hole it left is untraceable. That star disappeared, joining Shining stars of the past in the endless void. A parallel sky of sorts, like others that came before. That, sc that star unique. Newark street kid, beatnik, Kuwaita, communist. Not anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist. More spirit than ghost. Born Everett Leroy Jones. Renamed Blessed Prince inspired me to pick up the pen and fill notebooks with words that still move the people. That poem was called Shining Star on page 136 of Poets 11, 2015. I'm Dee Allen, you're the crowd. Thank you. We'll continue now with the, the second group, District 2, William Barton, Christy Delahanty, Stephen Gray, and we're going to also hear from someone who has to go to work. <laughs> yes, it's Sunday, but you know. Uh, and that's from District 11, Katie Wheeler Dubin. So welcome them all. Katie is with Katie? No, it's Sunday. Oh, well, uh, oh, she's not here then this evening, this day? Christy is not here? All right. Hello. Uh, this is called The Mothership. You were lost, asking how you got to be so rusted, crusty, fat, cold, and moldy, just at the age of 22. It was the freeways, the varicose vein vipers, that said you could learn coke at McD's doling flesh, or you could learn it somewhere else, but find your own damn money and leave me alone. And I found you in a supermarket aisle, draped in leopard print, tired, painted face, and you'd given life. Quetzalcoatl. The baby boy sucked the bottle. You never were taken out to dinner, and now the boy is two or three. You saved the candlelight for vigils. Stephen Gray. It's called a luxury apartment. I live in an apartment with amenities and not so many enemies, amen. It is a luxury apartment for the following reasons. It is quiet in the middle of the night and light is coming through the window in the morning. I'm lying in it with my privacy protected by the trees. I have the luxury of living with a woman who is in love with me. The luxury of books and periodicals and other information at my fingertips and no one breaking down the door to ask me questions. I am dialing up ethereal voices and emphatic sound effects. My mind is floating on the sound waves. In another room, there is an apple, and I have the luxury of living in a building full of waterfalls. They're hot and cold. A wood guitar, a few rugs from the Middle East, an old Arabian respect for running water, a proximity to infinite dimensions like the constellations on the roof. 
I am a few blocks from the ocean. Would you say a foghorn is luxurious? or living with electric currents running through the building. We are inhabiting the futurism of an Edison. Hot tea and honey and a humming typewriter with the leisure time afforded by the rent control. I have opinions and the luxury of living in the country with the working constitution. I'm luxuriating in the fact I'm not in jail and hardly ever have insomnia and winter never makes it here. I have a glass of wine, a loaf of bread, and my erectile function for a happy ending. <laughs> Thank you. This is called my hunger poem. Please eat this cut of meat. Eat your fill, your will of me, your eyes, such kind knives. I ask you this so vulnerably. My heart is a lion, a labyrinth, a liar. I got matadors and gryffindors and sphinxes within it. And depending on the time of day or shade of thunder's gray, how the rain drums or how recently I've come. My monsters and beasts bear their throats or their teeth or their tits. My heart's a mosh pit, red lights all lit. Sometimes too much salted grit, other times so wired. Babe, I'm a vampire, searching for love in the internal organs of a morning dove. Bothered and hot, this blaze can't stop mothered as it is in the belly of a screaming teapot. Make my stove groan until I moan, growl, purr, or snarl from horrible to humdrum, me a bat cave at dawn. Speak sweet words to me and I'll blossom so good. I'll swoon a smoky wood, a wolf cocked at dusk with her mouth full of blood. Other times at first light I fight, Raging the seas and the inner seas of my knees. Oh, what cutting winds, all these ego things. I'm a bad bitch and I like to fuck. And it's not a fucking problem, though it makes my shadow long and wrong. Makes me draw dragons. My hungry hot mouth that widens this far south. I leave love notes in your lair because I care, because loss is my nightmare. I hope we'll grow as intertwined as stacks of lies or like slices of apple in a cheddar cheese crust pie. I'm sorry for the love we've lost and the blood we've seared, but fuck the fear. I'm a woo you with finger tattoos and bed cover croons, seduce you under the full moon, ask you to kiss me in the street like a romantic geek. Please tinder my fire so tender Please tender my tinder like wire, so supple, drink my butter, it's tight. My sauce is no bark, just a bite. Get me smeared, my wood ache disappeared, wet my sauce deep in your beard. This love like teetering ledges, this KD bird dragon has soft wings with sharp edges, this terrible gnashing, this hunger. Our two worlds are crashing, this worlding jungle, this place we are waking makes me shake in the taking. Your blood I am drinking, it winds down my throat, it is hot as it's snaking, this dream we are making. Please eat this cut of meat, eat your fill, your will of me, your eyes such kind knives, you may break or cut or bruise me, please so tenderly fry me, eat me entirely. Bravo, brave. Now we'll, now we're going to the third district. The third district will feature Ann Leonard, Jean Powell, and Joe Pulicino. That's, uh, I think, the North Beach district. Yeah. And, uh, 
Annie. <laughs> Joe? Jean not here? Jean? All right. This is a Broadway Hill bohos. Red and green parrots burst from Senora de Guadalupe's eucalypti at Broadway Tunnel Hilltop, flocking crazy zigzags across the sky in noisy fall apart come together above church school gates as shrieking crush of children, bouncing laughter up, up, up hillside steps suffuses my descent past old flowing beard billy goat boho in shirtless cloud of funky sex musk pegging bicku stick in path to sun his horny eyes attention all on my tank top breast slows the moment but breaking in a sudden eclipse boho number two chinese twin pointed gray beard cloaked in bhikkhu muteness, wearing black wrap shades pushes bicycle up, handlebars tied with twin pink plastic bags, Powell Street takeout on one side for aging mother, found cans for quarters, the other bearing his burden home, my eyes telescoping worn buildings cakewalk, down either side of the street the slot, Broadway's long, long skip and slip to sweep of bridge and Bay's Hill's crimped rise, the keyhole sky, the key slides down the slot, tumblers spin, my hand is on the key, arc of rays hit, fovea centralis, macula lutea, the key in the keyhole, it's me I see, telescope down the slot, opening, opening, walking, projecting, Film strip of cellular light bodies pasted to face front, a box of light lit from circuits of somewhere, creating, creating from tunnel to bay, face full of Broadway, eye full of being, bronze filigree tunnel mouse, river of sound, School buses, taxis, motorcycles coming up through me. Cam, po, HK, greasy spoon, sip bar and lounge. Red lights, green lights, ocean pearl restaurants, gray foam, sidewalk scrub brushes, punctuating traffic, great min trading, lucky star discount, we do -si do casino, billboard, hot slots, gushing crazy sevens, floating Ben Franklin's uphill and down, HK, Anna, hair and beauty, bling bling cosmetics, Pet Central TVBI. We all go do -si do Broadway, dim sum, Ping Yuen projects, in a lazy reel, the Sam Wong Hotel, Big Al's The Condor, Crosswalk to Crosswalk, and Garden of Eden flashing neon taste of paradise, millions and billions kaleidoscopic human peddling, brief cloud of oyster sauce, a flowerage, all graffiti vegetable trucks from here to Shanghai, red wall of double decker, fire engine howl, deep horn blast, all doing the street corner do -si do diesel engines huffing, crossing Broadway forever, the hum of creation, seeing it all flying out of time, not even seeking, yet picked up by serpent's tail, carried in a flick of movement. Yes, the outflowing and convergence, fusing mo movement with the moment, light shooting onto the big nerve fiber screen. I'm creating it, creating it, seagulls drifting, distant, deeply planted bridge feet, Port of Oakland crane towers, white dazzle lineup, behemoth Trojan horses of trade, waiting tide flats in formation, looming black Mount Diablita tit, tugboat, fireboat, tuna boat, sailboats, 
crinkle of blue satin, diamond chip glitter, sea spew, resting yet not contained. It's a God's eye scene, and now forming, recoalescing, walking down the loping twist and curve, I find myself the only a she ever to skip and trip the slot, and ruminating, road riding, dharma boys scribbling, she devils and tantric sex, sex goddesses aplenty, Yet I find nary a bikuni none, and down at the dock on the bay, seagulls hover low and screech and scree at happy couples, babies, jump ups, arms flapping, screeching, louder yet louder screes as China seamen with old transistor lean smoking, grooving to tinny Hong Kong disco, and all now grooving at the dock on the bay, lapping, container ship waves, rhythmic sea slapping, and I say, yes, yes, it is me, the only a she bhikkhu ever casting self upon Posey's page, the only one so named. Yes, I am Broadway Hill boho number three. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I wrote this poem in celebration of a friend's uh, marriage, and uh, as you'll hear, it e evokes uh, the much storied wedding feast where uh, water was turned into wine. The poem is called uh, Miracles of the Vine. What astonishes everyone most at the wedding is that the best is saved for last. The host, Knowing there is nothing left in the cellar, smiles coyly at his steward's apparent sleight of hand. In ebullient with this impossible wine, he savors his guest's delight. Ah, this bouquet of the miracle of hospitality. Some guests, relishing a quick fix to turn the dance lighter, the tempo quicker, the singing more boisterous, and the coupling less discreet, barely taste the new wine's whole richness and lose the longer, more surprising finish. Others, though seeing the stunning ferment of a supple mind creating, accelerating the ordinary into the uncommon, do not appreciate the subtle hints of pineapple, mango, and soft oak. They do not notice the magic of this rich, lush miracle of nature's lovely balanced labor, roots drawing water from soil, Vines extending to sunlight, growing flesh of fruit, sweetness finely turned to spirit. It happens every season, day by day, miracles in ordinary appearances. In every vine, every taste, the miracles we savor, taking so long, becoming so common, barely seeing them happen at all. What astonishes me most about you is your living at the edge of miracle creating the best out of a long, late harvest, making it last. Miracles of the vine, complex and full-bodied, pour slowly. Thank you. Bravo. Okay. Now, now we go to District 4. That, oh, and I should say, by the way, those who, uh, who are not here, or either have another engagement or they're out of town, they will receive, of course, their, their, uh, the copies of, their, of the anthology. We'll hear next from Gloria Keeley, Robert Levette Smith, and uh, Matthew Monte. We have them here. I'm here. Yes. Here? Yes. Oh. Is Gloria here? Gloria is not here. Is Matthew Monte here? Also, he is not here. Terrible, terrible, terrible. <laughs> oh, terrible, terrible. Well, here's someone who believes in community. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Here you go, my friend. I got it. You got it, okay. 
Okay. You are Robert Levette. Robert Levette. Well, I would have been delighted to be here in any case, but as it appears I'm the only person from District 4 who made it, I'm especially happy to be here. <laughs> okay, now. <coughs> I thought a lot about which of the three poems to do, and I think this one's maybe the most fun. Uh, I'm sure there are some people out there who do go to the free concerts at Stern Grove. Yep, thought so. This is about one of those. It's called She's Not There. Taking the stage at Stern Grove, the zombies, not the somnambulant corpses that dominate movies and television these days, but the iconic British rock group, graying and crinkled, but still vibrant, Colin Blundstone's creepy tenor soaring over a rumbling bass. On the sides of the ravine, under the trees, the crowd, all t-shirts and sunscreen, applauds old favorites, tell her no, time of the season. The air's dense, hot, the medicinal treacle of eucalyptus battling the cloying of cannabis. For a moment, it's possible to imagine the summer of love risen from its flowery grave, and I wonder who was playing here then. But the illusion lingers only briefly, dissipating like a vaguely ple pleasant dream. Years sift through slanting light like pollen, like the husks of last season's seeds. She's not there. None of us are. Thank you very much, Jack. We'll continue with District 5. And District 5 is Lynn Barnes, Alice Chu, and Judith Yamamoto. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll begin with Lynn. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Jack. Nice to see all of you. This poem is called Bijou of New Orleans. Bijou meaning something small, delicate, and exquisitely wrought. And it's a poem for Ruby Bridges on her 60th birthday on September 8th, 2014. Bijou of New Orleans. At six, she walks past fear's sibling, hate, her shoulders high as if there might be something invisible lifting them. In her white dress with a matching bow, shoes, socks, radiant against her chocolate skin, she beams self-possession beyond her age. Every day for a year, beginning in 1960, dress-suited federal marshals with yellow armbands escort her to a New Orleans school where all the other parents have withdrawn their children, where she is now the lone student. They tell her not to look at anyone and the crowd around her jeering, and they lead her past a white wall splattered with hurled tomatoes. With a first grader's guileless determination she walks America 
past that white wall into a penetrating look at the slur scrawled next to her fresh-faced innocence. Cockroaches and mice come to feast on her abandoned lunches until her Boston teacher, Mrs. Barbara Henry, eats with her every day after this discovery, this hint of a silent, deeper disturbance sleeping in the basement of her courage. They learn together, care for one another all that year, even as mobs outside their school's walls shout obscenities at them. They travel from separate worlds, unite to form the unbreakable bond that comes from facing danger on a battlefield in comradeship with a fellow human. These two black and white facets of reality's diamond cut through the steel bars of an imprisoning culture. This child is immortalized with startling tenderness in Norman Rockwell's painting that President Obama hangs on a wall inside the west wing of the White House. The problem we all live with, Rockwell called it, when he offered it as the cover of a 1963 Look magazine. It is 50 years later when the first African-American president greets this woman who, entering her seventh year of life, helped cut away briars of hate, clear the trail he took to the Oval Office. The mythology of heaven is festooned with gold streets and shiny pearl white gates. While here on blue-green earth, we're blessed with incandescent arc-like visions of tiny, sturdy, ruby bridges. This year in Asia Minor, this year in Asia Minor, in an inland sea, the water rises. A woman goes on taking what she can carry, flight beginning on a night without moonlight, rain uncertain, and the distortion of that last tree. The Black Sea fills. Luck hangs on the fall of a veil, a woman turned away or allowed to go on, a child hidden, the hour irregular, unsteady in the low call of darkness. At those checkpoints where we wait, there is always a risk our disguises falling into disbelief. The passage to the Aegean Sea opens. A woman walks now in the shadows of the oldest stone beasts. A U.S. destroyer deploys from Norfolk. We cannot separate all of these parts. We cannot make them come together. We no longer know who we were. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from District 6, Sylvie Alcivar, Jay Passer, and Savadi Phaeton. Let's welcome them.
Jay, Jay is not here. Jay Pratzer, okay, Sylvie. This poem is for my mother. Listo. Mother, who cleaned the coffee machine with vinegar and didn't bother to give it a rinse before brewing a 12-cup pot, which out of want or forgetfulness, you'd just keep warming. Mother, who always began our phone conversations, oh, how you, you okay? A formality you didn't really understand, never leaving room for me to answer, having too much to say about esa hija de puta or the neighbor teniendo otro bebé or las barbaridades de la propiedad. Mother, who so often disappeared across the street to have your coffee on the porch with Nancy, stealing breaths of cigarettes you knew you'd never get back. Mother, who sat on a rock in the front yard sucking mango seeds, having eaten every ripe bit of flesh. We watched you, our eyes asking for what we'd never get. When you had your satisfaction, you'd toss the seed to us like the waiting dogs we were, and we'd gnaw on that soft stone. We'd scrape your desire satisfied into our own mouths. It always got caught in our baby teeth, but we learned how to pick it out by watching you use toothpicks. Mother, who shouted for us, tráeme la sal, though it was two steps in the cupboard right beside you. Maybe you wanted salt. Maybe you wanted a daughter to watch you cutting fat from thighs and bones, adding cumin and soy sauce and adobe seasoning. Maybe you wanted her to see how you never used a measuring cup or a spoon. Maybe you just wanted a body in the room while you sang Spanish pop songs off key and the radio played too loud. Dígame otro canción de amor. Dígame otro canción de dolor. Mother who forced us to sit in the front row at church, kneeling, standing, praying, for 45 minutes of faked faith to pass quickly. In these pews, turning to each other for peace be with yous and handshakes, I remember reaching for you, wondering how you came to have such soft hands. Mother, who for as long as I can remember went days without a bath without much reason, dark hair darkening under the weight of grease, making its own parts that didn't seem to move even when you touched them. I wondered why you didn't mind to seem the night smell you carried into the kitchen on your breath, calling out to us, cafe, listo. Mother, who when baths became as painful as the constant ache underneath your fingernails, stopped taking them more than a person should. But you were not a person, so much as a series of strange side effects that kept you constantly pressing your nails into the skin that hurt underneath them, as if to hold them together, as if pressing hurt against hurt could make it disappear. Mother, who refused to stop cooking though the heat of the stove made you wince. You sat in a chair to stir the stew, a solitary front row pew to honor what you could hold on to, cumin, soy sauce, lentejas, no measuring spoons, things that reminded you how it felt to be you. Mother, who grew wisteria and roses, lilies of the valley and bleeding hearts. Mother, who planted marigolds at Poppy's grave, always returning to collect the seeds in the same white envelope year after year after year. Mother, who's now buried beside him, no year engraved to mark your end because none of your children knew how or where to get that number set in stone, how to mark the day and year we became children without parents forever and ever, amen. Mother, who knew how to love children when they didn't know they were children, when they played viejito with a scrunched up face pressing against your laughter, your tenderness, which never li seemed to live past three years old. Mother, who oversalted dinner because you could no longer taste and so it was all too late discovered, this is why your tongue had ulcered, why tiny cuts felt like giant rips, why nothing tasted good, why nothing stayed inside for long. Mother, who bore the pain not on your fragile skin or inside your nearly arthritic bones, but in the shame that would have clung to your hair if baldness was not another side effect you wore, the kind of shame that weighed so heavy on your tongue, it turned all your wants, dame, digame, oye, listo, to silence. Mother, who began to say I love you before hanging up the phone, not as a feeling I understood so much as the truth of a life lived in the absence of actions that matched the words. Mother, who invited me to Ecuador para ver su vida, who laughed and laughed when mis primos y su madre 
con sus hermanas, and memories coming alive as I watched you laugh, as I've never seen you laugh, as if joy was the only thing that lived inside your skin. Mother, who understood Abuelita's face as she cried, holding my hands, sobbing and sobbing because she thought she'd never see me again, her dementia mistaking me for you because I was in her house, that was your house, and I have your name forever and ever, amen. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being here on such a lovely day. And to show my gratitude, I would like to read a poem called Kindness. Ah, here it is. Kindness. You do not need to see the bottom to know the lake is full. You do not need to count the stars to know there is no limit to the world. Distracted through the day by our fears and loves and sorrows, we are a part of that which has no center, the thread that quilts our lives together. An overflow of kindness surrounds us from the day we are born, set adrift on a breathable sea of light and air, powered by the tides of the sun and endowed with seamless growth and sleep's repair. Our share in life is kindness. It is kindness that we share, whether we breathe it in or breathe it out. We walk through time united by this, kith or kin, we are all the same kind. And if we wish to tithe the lot that we receive, we need to be reminded to endure and forbear, to not be eaten by our anger or diminished by our despair. Thank you. Okay, in District 7, Kenny Diana Chin, Alice Rogoff, Toshi Wajizu, and with Kenny, we'll read a poem about Cuba, Victoria Makinyana, We'll read it then in Spanish after he reads it in, in, uh, in English. Okay, here's the book, that's yours. Hi. Yeah, Ben. Hi, you have your book, Victoria. You too. Hi, you no. can't go shoot. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Kenny. In 2012, uh, we took a family people-to-people -people vacation to Cuba. After the uh, planet, friendly planet uh, tour, we were asked to write our impressions of Cuba. I wrote it and I thought, when poets speak, will governments listen? <coughs> so this is called Cuba my forgotten love. I went on a vacation during an August moon. I met her on the shores of La Habana. I looked into her eyes and saw her beauty and diversity. I looked into her heart and felt her love and friendliness. After a round of mojitos, I, I asked her her name. My name is Cuba, memories of defiant love 
and clashing futures spilled so much bitterness into the sea, sea until the ebb and flow of the waves washed the hurt away. I looked into her eyes again and saw a longing. I looked into her heart again and saw the scars of the embargo and the impoverishment. Her worn inaugural dress barely concealed the vestiges. I asked, do, do you not recognize me? Cuba's distant gaze turned to meet mine. Our love and passion turned so vengeful. Years of resentment has made me so wary. Your exceptionalism, your heavy hand, your schemes to subvert my historic revolution. Uh, I, I was more fearful of your suitor, but I know that there is no other now. Cuba stared silently into my eyes. I am independent, but the blockade is cruel. I dream of a world where we, we will be one human family. Cuba looked as beautiful as the day I left. Her luscious black hair swirling against green hills and white beaches. I, I have missed you. Even though we have become so different, I want to love you again. I am rich with funds, enterprise, technology, and know-how. You are rich in community, values, health, and resourcefulness. Let me love you again. Let us forgive our past misdeeds and regrets. Let us learn to love anew and to earn our blessings. Let us grow together a better tomorrow. Cuba's eyes moistened. On the bright shores, oh, the, the bright, on the bright shores of La Habana that night, the bright moon framed the visage of our embrace as we, as we kissed after 54 years of separation. I'm pleased and honored to uh, have translated uh, Kent's poem into Spanish. Cuba, mi amor olvidado. Bajo una luna de agosto de vacaciones fui. En las orillas de La Habana yo la conocí. Al inquirir en sus ojos su belleza y diversidad vi. Y en su corazón, su amor y simpatía sentí. Tras una ronda de mojitos, su nombre le pregunté. Me llamo Cuba. Recuerdos de amores desafiantes y porvenires chocantes derramaron tanta amargura en el mar. Hasta que el flujo y reflujo de las olas acabaron lavando su dolor. Inquirí otra vez en sus ojos y algo anhelante vi. De nuevo en su corazón inquirí. Las cicatrices del embargo y empobrecimiento vi. Su vestido desgarrado por el agua apenas podía sus vestigios esconder. Yo le pregunté, ¿es que no me reconoces a mí? La mirada de la distante de Cuba volteó a ver mis ojos. Nuestro amor y pasión se volvieron vengativos. Los años de resentimiento me han hecho tan cauta. Tu excepcionalismo, tu mano pesada, tus intrigas en trastornar mi histórica revolución. Tenía más miedo de tu pretendiente, pero ahora sé que ya no hay otro. Cuba me miró silenciosamente a los ojos. Soy independiente, pero el bloqueo es cruel. 
sueño con un mundo donde seamos una sola familia humana. Cuba se veía tan bonita como el día en que partí, su exquisito cabello negro y girando contra los cerros verdes y playas blancas. Yo te he extrañado. Aunque nosotros nos hemos vuelto diferentes, quisiera amarte otra vez. Yo soy rico con fondos, empresas, tecnología y conocimiento. Tú eres rica en cuanto a comunidad, sanidad e ingeniosidad. Déjame amarte otra vez. Perdonemos nuestros antiguos delitos y remordimientos. Aprendamos a amar de nuevo y merecer nuestras bendiciones. Cultivemos juntos un futuro mejor. Los ojos de Cuba se humedecieron. En las orillas de La Habana, aquella noche, la luna brillante marcó el semblante de nuestro abrazo. Mientras nos besamos, tras 50 años de separación. Gracias. Thank you, Jack, and thank you, the library. Sumi Abedin, I am going to 2 Folsom Street, the Gap headquarters down near the bay, a large square building dominating the block. I hurry to get to the rally to ask the Gap to sign the fire and building safety agreement. Sumi Abedin, a garment worker from Bangladesh, stands in front of inert pretend corpses shrouded in white sheets, her face a map of sadness. She jumped from a factory building on fire so her parents could identify her dead body, so she would be more than ash or flame, charred bones and tissue, a face, a name, a daughter, arriving on the sidewalk, whole but deceased, Yet she opened her eyes to the sunlight, to the smoke, to the fire. She asks, I keep thinking, will there be more fires, more collapses, more ash and burns, more nightmares, more sorrow? Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank Jack Hirschman and the friends of San Francisco Public Library. Jack is amazing with his energy, humanity, and passion for poetry. I am grateful for his generosity and continuing efforts for our communities. <laughs> Bastard. In the far corner of the schoolyard, they assemble after school. A gang of boys in military-style uniforms, girls in sailor blouses and pleated skirts. The jury appears on this judgment day. The prisoner's crime? She's poor and dirty. She snatched persimmons from the principal's garden, stole money from the offertory box at the temple, family of beggars under the bridge, a whore of a mother, and a couple of bastard kids. The girl stands in front of the crowd, her neck and legs dusky with grime, hair matted and unruly, eyes crazed with fear and hate. Children closing on the condemned, running the gauntlet. Thief, beggar, ugly bitch, Whore, toss her round among them. Dazed and helpless, she flails her arms. 
The executioner beats her down to the ground. You die! The mob shouts in unison, roused. Die! 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 One witness looks down at her, sprawled at their feet, hesitates for a moment, then joins the chanting. Die, you homeless bastard! The girl squats on the ground, her skirt unfurled like a shield. She shuts her eyes to the world. Sound of gushing water, a stream running down the dirt path. Oh no, she's pissing, pissing like a horse. The yellow streak separates the crowd. They scatter, run. In the deserted schoolyard, maple leaves rustle in the wind. Her knees bruised and naked, she wipes her nose with a sleeve and stands up alone in an ocean of orange sunset. Domarigato, thank you. All right, uh, Jean Powell has arrived from District uh, 3, so she will be reading with District. Now we're up to District 8, and that's Benjamin Finiteri, Mercilly Jenkins, and Stephen Coppell. Please. And Jean uh, Powell. Please come up. Here you go. There you go. There you go. All right. Thank you. Watch it. Oh, watch it, watch it. You're all right. No, that was good. That's done. Okay. Okay. So we're going with uh, your first. Yes, Benjamin Finitari. Hello. I'd like to thank Jack and the friends of the library and all of you for coming. Thank you. Why I fell in love with you. Your intensity is equal to Archimedes' death ray. The subjects of your focus undulate like Roman boats on the Mediterranean. They tack to avoid you, but you position your gaze with such precision your light finds a direct line, delivering heat and fire. You flash moments of listening brilliance, top 2% stuff. You're a grizzled detective, experienced in gathering facts, asking strong follow-up questions, attempting to discern motive. You hear the message under my noise, parse the elusive words, discover my obsessiveness and anxiety. Your sense of smell, so in tune with your surroundings, it conjures memories of my childhood, the safrit and laundry soap and sugary smell of my grandmother's hugs, the damp, hot air joining me during card games on my grandfather's porch on August nights in New England. You are accommodating to all tastes and preferences, understanding that so much of life exists on a continuum. You are a magician at mixing and matching ingredients, discovering the alchemy that makes everyone's palate celebrate. I know you think I'm stingy with your touch, and you're right, I am, but only because the power in your touch commands respect. It must be delayed, then cherished. Your look when I'm interacting with others, when you think I don't notice you. You watch my doubts keep me silent, how I hold my body weak at the lower back and shoulders. You note the fidgeting of my fingers. In these moments, the calm of your eyes, the barest hint of a smile, reminds me of your love, but I see there's more, something pressing you. You wait until we're alone in the car, where I'm free from embarrassment, but also unable to escape, to deliver the message I most need to hear. 
Step up your game, you tell me. There's an angel inside of you. You've shown it to me. Now show it to everyone. Thank you. Okay, hello, thanks for coming. It's great to be here. And thank you, Jack. Uh, the poem that I'm going to read was inspired by a NPR radio report that I read and also a photograph that I saw several years ago. It's called Dolphin Report. The experimenters are proud of their discovery. Dolphins not only have a unique whistle, a sound, a song, they can recognize the signature sound of any dolphin they have ever known. The experimenters arrive at, their th at this conclusion by playing recordings of dolphins to dolphins in captivity who were at one time in close proximity. They monitor the dolphins' reactions swimming more quickly around their enclosure, repeatedly responding to the calls with their own songs, circling, searching, long, elegant noses sliding up against the glass. Imagine, you hear the voice of a lost friend, that distinct timber of a loved one who's been missing, perhaps now found, but there's no one there. It's just an experiment. The experimenters do not interpret the impact of their procedures, but the dolphins do. A, potty, a pod of these large-bodied, beautiful swimmers witnessed the deep water horizon's disaster, leaping in air as one to see the ocean on fire. What did they report? There is a curious species here, lives on land but can swim, only recognizes one song. I want to say thanks to all of you for showing up, for sticking around for the good stuff yet to come. <laughs> ah, that music. Fox and Foxy trot on over when the music swings. Music downside up, measure syncopated wild enough for mad hatters hell-bent on the chase, tie for second place, necks numb from necking with a dumb waiter, who opens the gate to rumba rousers in loose trousers up all night, and to those down on their luck who hit the hay in by-the-day rooms, band stands, easy bends, sits, stretches its first swing set, notes spilling around couples loco with motion. Basses and sacks pick up the beat, toss it to couple 21. That's Lois and Clark on the low down from Terrytown who step on it, feel their feet absorb the heat. They fly the floor, not there anymore. Piano keys unlock wish boxes from which dancers spin and grin. Ah, uh, those musicians from tonight's rubber band hitting highs all night, accordion to the blonde, lanky lounge lizard who's saving her notes, usually bundled twenties for some goofy gag or gamey gig that pays big bucks, though wily Ginny Grin runs this show out of cell 69. Bookings managed by Matilda, master of arts and potty mouth darts, who waltzes around on tiptoes, 
jockeying for lead inside position on every ballroom floor in Baltimore. Thanks for listening. Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. Except for the official camera, I'm going to ask that other cameras be turned off, and uh, cell phones as well. Um, thank you. This is called Word Storm. Saturday Night Adventure in the Blinding Rain. G.K. telephones from Vallejo, wants me to hear him feature and wants to hear my new poem during open mic. But it's Vallejo, so what can I do? Cable car ride and ferry boat trip and then a long walk. Am I up for this? One time I had asked G.K. whether he liked living there with his current love and whether it was a good place for me to move. No effing way, he said. I mean no effing way. There is no effing way you should ever effing move to effing Vallejo, effing ever. Do you effing hear me? GK liked to make a point. And in case you're wondering about my use of that term, when I was a child and said a bad word, my mouth was washed out with Fells naphtha laundry soap, and so I still can't say that word in public, so sorry. The magic day arrived when GK was being featured in Vallejo, but it was pouring rain, pouring felines and canines with dolphins thrown in. The raindrops had gills. I gathered my good luck charms in a spiritual huddle, and off the gang of us went in the wet and windy downpour. Anything for poetry. Anything at all. My London fog umbrella had suffered near-fatal damage in the last rainstorm caught in a burst of hail outside the old Sears Roebuck store on the Sonic, but it still had a few minutes of service remaining. So my battered umbrella and I forged a path through the rain from cable car to ferry boat in record time. That tough little ferry rocked and rolled all the way to Vallejo while I downed multiple glasses of wine to keep my courage dry. My cantankerous poet friend was celebrating a birthday in a town he hated, but in a tiny coffee house he loved, just a few blocks from the pier, and I promised to be there. Suddenly I was on stage during open mic with a passel of musicians while it rained outside like there was no tomorrow. I read aloud my new poem about romantic love in a menstrual storm, feeling wonderfully grand for a rain-soaked Saturday night. G.K. roared with delight. There it was, sex talk, rough cider, poetry in the raw, joys of menstruation, foot-stomping jazz, pesky raindrops, carafes of wine, and my birthday friend laughing as though he were back in New York and free of Vallejo forever. Thank you. Okay, at, uh, now for District 9, well, you heard D. Allen earlier. We have Miriam Mueller and Carlos Suarez. Miriam Mueller and Carlos Suarez. Miriam, here you go. Carlos is not here. He's in what? Ah. Oh, okay. All right. So then, go ahead, Miriam. Thank you, Jack, and friends of the library, and all the poets in San Francisco who create the atmosphere for this. Uh, America in present tense. And there's a historical note to this. The reference in this poem is to the workman's circle, which with similar organizations not only helped forge the unions 
but put in place for their members those benefits and rights while they fought to legislate them for all workers. America in present tense. The past is present. Jefferson, crafting from ideas and thought both his house and the shape of a nation. Lincoln, pausing amid war and opposition to send words of hope to a widow, to the survivors, to the future. My great-grandparents, selling everything but clothes and memories, taking ship to become strangers in a foreign-tongued future for life, for their children's education. And their children, using that schooling and the dream to fight unfeeling greed for a living wage, laboring late under the lamplight, studying, meeting, to shape what people working in union could do, win the right to vacations and build a country camp to enjoy them, combine to pay doctors for members hurt and sick, create a safe haven for those who live to retire. Other heritages tell other ancestral tales, and the richness and strength of this land includes this generation now stooping in the hot fields, living the tales their lawyer and teacher grandchildren will tell. Let us embrace the strength, the courage, the selflessness, the risk of being unpopular, denounced, defamed, insulted, scorned, as those before us were, to deserve what we have inherited enough to pass it on. Okay, we are, we're now going into this two more districts. Uh, District 10 is Anita Odina Cruz, Rebecca Fugate, and Raven Singh Mikta. Would you come forward, please? No one is here? None of them are here? Oh, no. Ah, yeah. Bravo, bravo. Bravo. Who is that? Anita? Anita. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, my dear. I'm glad you're here. That's beautiful. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy to be here and uh, be part of the Point 11, 2014. I'm so thankful to Jack for uh, being very generous and the San Francisco Public Library. My, my poem is inspired by one of my clients. I'm a tax preparer here in San Francisco who just uh, lost her apartment from Ellis Act. So this, the title of this poem is Ellis Act in San Francisco, California. Hundred twenty days, I'm still angry at the fog that curls and hangs above the rooftop of my apartment, like a ghost at the past of this Victorian house. Morning ache, I feel the angry turn of my landlord. It still is looking for me anyway, oblique to get me out of this contract. Hardened, encrusted, Bannister, I stayed at this apartment for a hundred months. Ink stains, time prints and all, letters, calendar bills, and even the last sticky notes. These tilted chairs, I cling to climb the rugs. Letters and all the yawning fire escapes. The landlord's silence frightens me most. There is something behind the smoke alarms. Even the cockroaches knew something is coming up. The burden 
I carry pushing my baggage, outgrown garbage to another place. His silence should have worn me through the years. The look brute knives during his last visit. I know my rights, I said, trying to tie up loose ends, looking for some conversation, for sentiment, for memory, and unclutter the tables and the closets. I keep a child in my room, I said. I cannot leave him behind. My only hope, my only life. Are you deaf in both ears, I asked him, hearing the cries of the abandoned child. No sound, he replied, as I locked the door and closed the windows, my child still screaming in my mind. Thank you so much. And the last district, Jeanette Cavano, Alelia Amabel de Castro Nuguid. And you've already heard Katie Wheeler Dubin. So let's welcome the two. My dear. Hello. Okay. Jeanette. Cavano. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you all for persevering all the way to District 11. <laughs> and thank you, Jack, and friends of the library. Um, I'm going to read a poem that I wrote a couple of years ago when my father was dying and I felt like the whole world needed to stop and let me deal with that um, and it didn't. This poem is called After the Diagnosis. So it turns out one day is not so different from the last. Calla lilies turn brown at the edges, milk sours in the sink, snails suck holes out of strawberries in the garden. Dusk colors the city streets with its auburn melancholy. Yesterday, the man in the apartment on the corner planned to live forever. Today, he is dying. Oh, not like we are all dying, inch by inch, dealing out loose change on lattes and other people's pain, hamstrung in grocery lines with carts full of organic hot dogs and hormone-free milk counting back the morning as we watch the old woman in front fumble with her checkbook. In the apartment, he is dying by miles, eyes stripped bare, breath short and shorter, blue feet and purple hands with broken strands of music in his ears. Still, there is laundry to be folded and potatoes to be mashed. With his daughter, the man gathers words like cockle shells, lashes stories together into a raft. They draw the evening out and out. No matter, tomorrow comes crashing through the door without permission. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to add my thanks um, for staying to the end of, the, of this event. Um, it's been so wonderful to hear everyone read and be a part of this group of people in this room right now who are brought together by proximity and by poetry. This poem is called November. When I try to recreate the late nights, they are nothing but sober mornings in disguise. Maybe because it is not October. 
This, now, is the month of stomachs. Bears and hedgehogs make ready to sleep across the tundra expanse of hunger. In this way, there is control, if not over time, then over the effect of time. In a black planner, I map the hours and assign purpose to each in increments of one or two. Comfort resides in clear delineations. The October pages are almost untouched. A marker of abandon starting the day we met. After, I charted hours again as for other lesser months. Always the small and stupid things awaken memory. Is it mine or his? Or is it absolved from belonging? He appeared at the door, still unsteady from nighttime activity. I stole a book for you, he said. A gray-green volume from the university library, unlikely to be missed. Until several Novembers from now, an American Studies PhD candidate seeks the 1941 issues of Mencken's American Mercury, concerned with the cultural milieu of World War II era American intellectuals. And when he reaches the shelf in Three East, he will find space enough for a gray-green volume. I hope he will understand. One reaches fullness only after the feeling of interminable emptiness. For bears and hedgehogs, there is the fullness, and then there is the devouring. November, the month of stomachs, stands a poor and useless imitator of October, the month of appetites. In return, I gave him a poem in a stolen envelope. Birds were waking, yet it was not a late night, but the mere ghost of one, like hours in a black planner, defined and then erased. What I wrote for you, I said, I didn't mean it, only the part about late nights. He said, quit being so critical, I really liked it. When there is no hunger, what are we left to fill? When there is no hunger, what do we become? And what becomes of us? Hunger is becoming in bears and hedgehogs but only when they rise from months long sleep after having chewed slowly on energy reserves. They wake to a spring morning, a world shaken of snow, ready to be complete again. Thank you all. Uh, let me just say that it's been a great pleasure and honor to read all the wonderful poetry, some of which you've heard, and others, uh, the other ones you I hope you'll read in the volume of the Poets 11 anthology of this year. Uh, what you have heard today is actually the poetry of the city of San Francisco. Uh, I tried to be in choosing the work as diverse as this city is with its dimensions and strands of social and political struggle that are continually going on. And you'll hear that in any future Poets 11 events that will take place. So thank you very much. I'm very glad that you were all here.